Greetings, and welcome to another episode of Artsy AF Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Norris. Thank you for being here. This week, my guest is Sarah Jane Jameson. Sarah is an artist who uses colored pencil, marker, gouache, ink, and paint pens to create images about our modern age using traditional media to unify the digital world that we find ourselves in. On this episode, Sarah and I get into the collective art world and everyone in it as a mentor, uh, the ratio of rejection to success and opportunities, some administrative work that comes with being an artist that before you're a professional artist, you might not realize you got to do. And we talk about her process and routine and her story, of course. So I think you guys are really going to like this episode. Definitely listen all the way to the end. Lots of good insights here. And this week, I have two new patrons on the Patreon, one of which I just mentioned, Sarah Jameson. Thank you so much for subscribing. It really does make me feel great when other artists slash guests on the podcast believe in what I'm doing enough to drop a few dollars per month in the old Patreon. The second is Michael Kamara, and he is coming up. I've been banking a lot of episodes lately. I'm about four ahead of schedule right now, which feels really great. And Michael will be up in a couple weeks. Be sure to check out his work. You can find him at M Kamara on Instagram, all one word. I'll have the link in the description there. And you can find Sarah at Sarah Jane Jameson. Do be sure to check out her work. It's really amazing stuff, highly detailed, great images, kind of using a montage of, I guess you could call them icons that we so frequently come across in our world today. So thank you guys very much. Very excited to have you on board. Big admirers of both your work. And yeah, it just really makes me feel good. So thanks so much. And if you, that's right, you, listening right now to these words, these very words. If you would like to become a patron, please go over to patreon.com slash podcast. I'm creating the artsiest podcast in the known metaverse. And you can help support. $4, $8, $16 a month. You choose. You get video. You get guest suggestions and you get merch in each respective tier and of course those compound as you get higher and higher so yeah this has been a long intro let's jump right in to the show here is sarah jane jameson yeah so usually how i kick these off is i ask you about your backstory and how it was that you came to be an artist and what what you know like we can go as far back into like childhood as, as is relevant i guess okay sure um well it's really uh to take it all the way back to childhood it's sort of the only thing that i've ever wanted to do or pictured myself doing um so it's always been the trajectory I saw my life being on and something, you know, being an artist is something that's kind of like inseparable from my um, personal identity. Yeah. So uh, I knew I was headed to art school and I knew that's what I wanted to do. So um, I did. And that's how I ended up in Washington, D.C. I went to the Corcoran College of Art and Design and I um, graduated in 2010 and you know, it took a little bit to kind of get things off the ground, um, kind of detox from four years of, you know, making art kind of on an assignment basis, mm -hmm. thinking about what I wanted to do, like the how and why of my practice. Um, and I would say in about 2016, um, I started really um, putting myself out there and kind of getting some momentum with my artwork. Nice, nice. The short story. Sweet, and you're you're using mostly um, like 
I see color pencil, I see um, mm -hmm. inks, and it's yes. very, very detailed. Um, and by the way, love, love your work. It's like astounding to, to watch it. And, and I love all the videos that you post. It's so detailed. It's so impressive. Mm -hmm. So have you been drawing for since you were like a little kid? Is that what you were like? Yeah. You, were you just born with like, like, oh, I'm going to be an artist and there was never any other, any other idea yeah. of doing anything else? <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. You know, I I am very fortunate to have like um, parents, but primarily my mom who raised me, who were really, my mom was really um, happy to like let me choose and pursue the things I was passionate about, you know, mm -hmm. and never like poo pooed it or um, said it was silly or. I feel like when you say you want to go to art school, plenty of people, you know, immediate family, extended family will kind of be like, oh, good luck, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, but someone who took the things that I valued very seriously. Um, and so when I said that's what I wanted to do or be, you know, to the best of her ability, she fostered that. So I give her a huge amount of credit for never, you know, in any way um, stepping on the things I dreamed about. Um, but I always did a lot of drawing, some painting as well. Um, but by the time I was probably about halfway through uh, being in college, I really settled on colored pencils as something that I loved. Um, and part of that is just, you know, you can't put into words why something is more intuitive to you than something mm -hmm. else. But it also has the component of very high control, <laughs> which yeah. is something that appeals to me. It's very immediate. There's no cleanup or um, color mixing that you have to do and then going back and trying to have to refine that color. Yeah, uh, It's very available, immediate, and kind of permanent. You have to sort of stand in the choice you make or you hope that you can kind of scrape it away with an X-Acto knife to fix it. But uh. um, it's something that has always been the strongest interest of mine. Um, and I've always had drawing as a part of my practice, even when I was really little before it was like a practice. Yeah. 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 I would definitely want to get into, uh, get into your work. Uh, kind of one more question I'll ask you about your, your backstory. Um, sure. or maybe two actually, when, when yeah. you were growing up, did, did, were you living in DC? No, okay. I'm from Orange County, okay. <laughs> Virginia. Oh, so wow. it's, Okay. Smack dab in the middle of Virginia. Okay, gotcha. Did you feel like a, a weird kid when you were growing up? Or like a, like, what was it yeah, like? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I definitely had, you know, a friend group. Um, and growing up in Orange, I definitely felt um, different, you know, and there wasn't a lot of things, resources for the arts. I can't speak to what it's like now, but the majority of that county is relatively rural. Um, yeah. And I just always sort of felt like I was um, just different. I don't even know how, how to describe it, you know, and um, I mean, it's not that I had like a terrible experience at school. I think I had the run of the mill. <laughs> had friends, sometimes teased, those sorts of things. Right, um, yeah. But, but by high school, you know, my mom worked in the city of Fredericksburg um, city. Mm -hmm. And I was like, please, you know, can, can I, I got to get out of Orange at least and try to make my way to a place, which I think Fredericksburg has a pretty, for what it is, like a very beautiful um, appreciation for arts and a pretty solid art scene. Yeah. Um, but I wanted you know, more diversity in every way that could be defined. Um, sure, so sure. Trying to inch my way <laughs> towards a place where there was just a more um, expanded way of thinking about everything. You know, I, I don't want to totally. like pigeonhole Orange County's like, but um, yeah, just yeah. wanted more. Yeah. yeah, I feel you. Yeah, I, I grew up in um, in Lexington, Kentucky, which is a bit more, okay, yeah. <laughs> a bit more, um, I guess like, you know, it's more like a city, college city. Um, mm -hmm. But it, everything, at one point I remember thinking like everything here feels so um, 
normal, you know, like mm -hmm. just a hundred percent average <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and kind of, kind of whitewashed, kind of like at yeah. the time, not, not super appreciative of, of art and music. And I yeah. just, I just remember being like, well, it's either California or Colorado that I'm going to move to. And I chose Colorado. <laughs> So I, right. I, I kind of vibe with, with what you're saying there. Um, I wanted to ask also, um, did you have any mentors um, outside of just normal professors, or maybe they were just normal uh, uh, professors who, who gave that extra, um, extra advice and, and you, maybe you spent some extra time with who helped you out? Honestly, I don't know. Um, you know, I went to the Corcoran was a pretty small school. And so um, there was probably about 100 people per um, grade. Okay. Nice. So you did get a fair amount of personal attention in that way. Um, I don't know if off the top of my head, I can think of like, any particular sort of extra attention I got. Um, but that said, like I do retain all of my friends um, for the most part from school mm -hmm. and they're a wonderful sounding board. I met my husband there um, awesome. and he's someone who, uh, you know, I'm very fortunate. Sometimes I have friends um, or know people in creative fields and their partner doesn't necessarily um, appreciate the wrong word, but when you aren't um, immersed in that community any more than I wouldn't know what like an astrophysicist job would be like, but right. um, when someone has experienced that same thing and has that appreciation and can give you an honest critique, um, and that goes for all of my friends I met in school and out and after as well. Um, but I feel like that's a community that uh, I draw on more than having a mentor per se. Um, for sure, yeah. Uh, I don't know that there's like any one <laughs> person who jumps out. Yeah, I feel I feel like oh, if you. Sorry, what? No, I was like, hopefully I don't think of it later and go, oh gosh, I forgot. You well, know, if you but... if you think of it, feel free to <laughs> stop us dead in our tracks and and shout that person okay. out because that's, that's. I know it. I don't want to be remiss. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I think if you look at it right, like anyone can kind of be your teacher, right? Like. You can, oh, yeah. you can see what other people are doing, especially nowadays um, with social media and all that. And you can either be like, that seems to be working for them oh, and right. and talk to them about it and, and really interact and, and kind of build these uh, connections with people. Absolutely. And, it's do or die, I feel like, to be active on social media, oh, yeah. career-wise. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. How do you, uh, this is something we talk about all the time on this show. And, um, I'm always curious as to how people sort of balance their social media production with consumption. How are you doing with that? Are you, uh, does it ever uh, get to you? <laughs> yeah. You know, I think, um, I certainly spend more time aimlessly scrolling and looking at like weird, whatever weird stuff catches my eye on there. Um, but I do try to be productive. Mm -hmm. um, and I talk about this a lot, you know, with artist friends. Um, and it's such, you know, in some ways a drag to have to really always, you know, just always having to think about how um, you can, can demonstrate your productivity, having to um, have the creative output to, always have something on, you know, or frequently enough have something on social media. Yeah. Um, you know, and just having to always have that as part of your calculation of your practice. But um, for me, it's so valuable. Um, something is kind of is like somewhat of a segue, I guess, but, yeah, yeah. you know, being an artist comes with a immense amount of rejection. You know, ultimately you apply to things and you're rejected all of the time. Yes. Um, and I've found that um, the last handful of years have been an absolute avalanche of rejection, but the um, amount of work that I've put into having things on social media, um, demonstrating my work there, sharing my work has been the precondition for a lot of opportunities that I didn't see coming. And so for myself, even when I'm on there aimlessly, I try to make it productive, but um, 
it's really such an amazing tool for being findable. And ultimately that is everything to being an artist. I graduated in a time before it was right on the cusp of like social media becoming a tool. Um, Mm -hmm. And so that wasn't (laughs) included. I hope it's included now in arts education, but um, you know, really navigating that and, and, and incorporating it into like that daily checklist of things you do is so critical. So I try to make it mostly work related. Yeah. <laughs> Browsing yeah. is not always. Yeah. 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 Like I find myself um, scrolling like a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And I also don't, I, I'm kind of hesitant unless I'm promoting like a, a product or something to, to like show older work. I'm, Mm-hmm. I really like to be like, all right, you know, make a painting two weeks later, here's the new one, you know, but mm-hmm. I know that it's crucial to, you got to yeah. remind people that you still exist amongst the, like, I mean, yeah. you know, I follow thousands of people and they're all like super talented artists, you know? Exactly. And, uh, yeah, it's just one of those things that, um, you never thought, or at least I didn't when I was like, oh, I'm going to be an artist. I never thought that uh, half the half the job would be promotion all the time, and then yeah, and and also like I never thought I would be filling out so many applications either, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's you don't realize um, the amount of writing, the mm-hmm. amount of bookkeeping. You're unless you're very fortunate, you know. You're also your advertiser, your designer, your, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like the social media manager, Mm -hmm. you know, there is a ton of, I mean, frankly, very sort of unsexy things that come with Mm -hmm. just creating the work and then getting it out there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a lot. You wear a lot of hats. Yeah. Yeah. You're everything from the CEO all the way down to the janitor, (laughs) Yeah, you know? Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) It's pretty, it's, yeah, that's kind of uh, part of the reason I do this podcast, sort of uh, create like a full picture of what Mm -hmm. it means to, to be an artist, because most people just see process videos or us selling prints or whatever it is on social media. And they're like, I want to do that. And then you get into it and you realize that the map is not the territory and that (laughs) it's it's a little bit like different terrain. Yeah, exactly. You know, and there's just no one way and there's no right way. Um, yeah. You know, people will ask sometimes the best way to do it, but it's like really the answer is you just have to start doing it. Yeah. I don't know the, the way yeah. To say it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so when you went to art school, were they, were they talking about the business aspect of art at all or was it mostly technical? stuff yeah not really mm-hmm. i was just discussing this at the mural with someone else who went to art school mm-hmm. and i won't say what school <laughs> but um <laughs> you know talking about how so much of the emphasis was on that kind of intellectual part um mm-hmm. which is super important you know the concept and your why and um not so much you know i took a one class in one semester that was kind of it may even have been called professional practices. I can't remember now. Mm-hmm. Um, but even then, I feel like the definition was quite narrow in the sense of they're speaking in terms of being a um, exhibiting artists in galleries, which is amazing and, and is one way to do it and is certainly the way I'm trying to do it. But definitely, there is a, a myriad of ways that you can apply that art degree um, And I don't know that it was very explored or even discussed. Um, A lot of it was just the theory, I would say, of of creating art, which again is super important, but I don't know that it allows you to hit the ground running and not feel like you're committing tax fraud (laughs) every time you file your taxes, (laughs) like, oh, I hope this is right. Um, (laughs) So, you know, all that to say, there are a lot of valuable things that I did learn. Um, But I would say the nuts and bolts of being a working artist was not necessarily one of them. Yeah. And I I think it's a common experience um, for those that went to art school, at least totally colloquially, I would say. Yeah, yeah, definitely. 
Are you? Are, do you keep a ledger for uh, for expenses and and like uh, yeah. credits? I, guess. I keep an Excel sheet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's and, uh, what I meant, basically. I'm sure it could be. You know, maybe I don't. I don't have like QuickBooks. I'm sure there's like a better, yeah. more streamlined way. But it's just me usually, like at the eleventh hour before tax time, like putting yeah. it all in and crunching the numbers. Yeah. Same. I used to do this thing when I when I first started. I was like, oh man, I didn't, I didn't like work at a job very much at all this year. And I'd save all my paper receipts for expenses and like yeah. g just go through my bank account and like, you know, download the bank statements and be like, yeah. okay, let's see. Here's a, here's a plane ticket. All right. And it was just yeah. like, <laughs> just such a mess, you know, like, uh, yeah, I don't know. That's just th th again. There's another thing that like people don't expect to yeah. to come yeah. in contact with maybe before they right. s decide like I'm going to be a professional artist. And it's like, oh no, you gotta you gotta do taxes. I mm -hmm. mean, mm -hmm. you know, keeping all your receipts, being mindful of like even minor purchases. Half the time, I know. For example, you might hop on Amazon. I'm like, ah, uh, I'll just you know, it's a new pair of shoes and let me buy like a bulk pack of mailing tubes you know and then right. remembering we like, like split off that cost so i mean there's a lot yeah there's a lot there's just so much that's unglamorous and necessary and requires a lot of brain power and work and time um to make it all go you know yeah one one thing that i try and do now is is put all my expenses art expenses, like you were saying just now, like, um, it, differentiating when I buy things, like instead of mm -hmm. buying like the shoes with the mailing <laughs> tubes at the same time, you're just like, wait a second, wait a second, mailing tubes. Uh, this is going to come back yeah. to haunt me in about three months when taxes are due. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, yeah, it's just something that, you know, trial and error I've learned over the years, just like keep it all on one card and just keep it streamlined yeah. and just keep that in mind it's funny how like honestly like sometimes the if you think about it you know with our creative brains we can sort of make any expense that we spend into an art expense right and i mean of course the <laughs> the bean counters at the irs would probably uh disagree with us but uh it all Absolutely. just kind of like runs yeah, together Netflix. <laughs> what'd you say oh yeah netflix yeah you need to yeah, decompress netflix. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i know i always that's where i'm wondering i'm like yeah i'm gonna write off my all my electric bills yeah, yeah. all everything i mean i'm working in my home yep so yeah yeah you do get yeah. that what square footage thing right Heck yeah yeah <laughs> Definitely. yeah turbo tax is, yeah. has been very helpful for me um absolutely but yeah, I, I'm I'm also curious as to things like um, you you seem very regimented just from our short talk already. Um, what what is your daily routine like? What are some things that you, get you primed to like open up your mind and be creative? Um, you know, usually I'm. You're right. I'm quite regimented and planned. I like a. I like to know where I'm headed. Um, generally speaking, if it's, uh, a day in the studio, I'll have planned out my piece. You know, I really respect and I'm sort of in sold by artists who just, you know, sit down and start their drawing and they don't know where it goes. Um, but for myself, it's something that I'm always gathering imagery. Sometimes I'll just spend an evening wind down after a day of work. Sorry, this answer is probably all over the place, but no, go for it. Um, collecting images, you know, I'm kind of looking through royalty-free websites. Um, maybe it's a word or, you know, I'm constantly putting that into a folder on my desktop. Um, and then when I'm creating a piece, I'll begin by, um, sometimes there's a prompt, you know, I may be fortunate enough to be in a show with a theme, or if it's just work that I see as my main vein of work, um, I'll lay it out in Photoshop and that allows me to really fiddle around with the composition until I'm 
completely and entirely happy. Mm -hmm. um, and then what I compose there becomes the reference for my drawing. So a day in the studio, we'll be working on that. You know, generally I'm starting the black background first because it's paint and I mm, hate to think of like, although my last step is also paint, but anyway, mm -hmm. um, you don't want to, you want to avoid big mistakes on top of finished work, um, big permanent mistakes. Mm -hmm. But really it's drawing, just sitting here, um, being in the zone, listening to music or podcasts. You know, that's a perfect day where I'm just drawing um, and as far as, you know, being inspired or turning your brain on, having my studio in my home leaves me no excuses to get, to get to work. Right. Yeah. So there's always that slight guilt if I'm not working and I know like it's here, it's right here. I have something I need to do. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes, you know, the greatest motivation is the deadline that quote is hundred percent accurate. Yeah. And then. I always try to keep the mindset, you know, some days you're magically inspired and ready to work and you've got like, you know, things you just have to get out of your head. But sometimes I have to really think, you know, like this is my job. I want this to be my job. I want right. this to be my full-time job. So I got to get up and get in there and make the work even when I'm feeling like I'd rather just lay around and, you know, do something unproductive. Um, that, that's so important. Yeah, it's super important. I think it's a hard thing to uh, always want to do, but it's critical if you, you know, I feel like there's a lot to be said about like endless work culture and hustle culture, but um, sure, sure. it is kind of relentless hustle culture, I think, to make a full-time arts practice work, unless you're very fortunate and you kind of stumbled into immediate success. Um, yeah, yeah. That's not even the perception that that exists, you know, there's that saying that it takes 10 years to be an overnight success. Um, yeah. So that, that is to say, I get myself in there because I'm on that 10 year <laughs> overnight success plan, I hope. Yeah. Um, yeah. Same here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think that, um, I think that it's, it's tough at first to, to think of it like a job or it was for me at least because <laughs> it, you know, it brings such joy and doesn't feel like work. And it's this kind of, um, and you may have a different experience, but I'm, I'm just speaking personally here. Like it, it just put me in this space where I did, I wasn't thinking about the normal day to day, like, or any problems or it didn't feel like I, I even had problems while I was painting. Right. Um, but then, but then like, so I guess my question would be like, how are you just, are you just a disciplined person or did you have to kind of come to a point where you realize that even though I'm feeling like not that great today, I'm not going to succumb to, uh, the resistance of like sitting on the couch or doom scrolling or doing, or doing whatever, being distracted. Right. Uh, I, love, I do plenty of those things. And, For, you know, a lot of the work I think is relative to that, like doom scrolling digital culture. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. World. But, you know, I, I am a pretty disciplined person mm -hmm. and my baseline personality is pretty like, um, I would describe myself as a perfectionist. Um, mm -hmm. You know, wanting everything just so. Um so for me, it definitely um, expresses itself positively because I right. get, I do get things done. I think of things that way. I don't not finish projects. Right. Um, that's something I think that I do well, but that that's like <laughs> the positive side of the coin of, I think how I'm just wired, you know, it often comes with a ton of self critique and when you're working full-time art as as you may know or even not i spent plenty of time trying to work as close to full-time as possible on art while having full-time jobs right um but uh it, it then becomes such an outlet but then also a huge source of like pressure and anxiety and you know this thing that brings you great joy is also this thing that brings you um money so, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, there, it, it then becomes, I think, that's another thing that in the arts world that maybe doesn't get discussed 
just because there's that romanticized idea of being an artist. But when something that's, at least for myself, I think of as very critical to my self, my personality, my being, but mm -hmm. it's also like, hey, uh, you know, you want to take this job and make X amount of money and then do prints here and then sell it out. And there's always the bills to pay, life to live. Yeah. You know, it becomes very um, melded in a weird way that uh, I don't know if that got really tangential for what we were talking about, but no, um, it's okay. It's okay. But uh, yeah, I do. I'm pretty good about sitting down and working anyway to take it back to the point. But mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And you mentioned like hustle culture, um, earlier. Yeah. Um, we, how do you decompress, you know, like, do you, do you set like, um, kind of a window of like, okay, like it's like you're clocking in and you're, you're like, I'm at least clocking in, let's say at like 9am, 10am this, uh, this morning. Mm -hmm. And, and then do you have a, do you have tricks for like, knowing how to stop because i've i've i know for me like i've had trouble like finding the brake pedal sometimes in one day you know what i'm saying and then the next day it like bleeds mm -hmm. over into the next day and then i'm like right. a little bit off and my sleep schedule goes like back and forth so right. so are you doing like um a cutoff time too and how do you decompress after that um, I'm not great at, you know, I shoot for eight hours, but especially if I'm on a deadline, it's like, I'll work till I need to work to, right. to, for me, it's like getting it done comes first. And I'm not always great about taking the time, um, to just decompress because mm -hmm. then it's like, even when I go down, you know, my downstairs is where we chill upstairs is where my studio is. Um, you know, it's like. I'll hop on my phone and I try to then be productive and like, let me see what galleries are following who and, you know, mm -hmm. follow this person do that. And, um, so I'm not, I'm not great at that, but, um, I do really enjoy reading. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a big reader, although even that kind of feeds the artwork I'm creating, um, decompressing, you know, so I'll try to do something very, um, unrelative to what I'm doing gardening something i found that i love in the last few years awesome um let me think thrift shopping watching wrestling with a big wrestling fan oh uh, yeah nice. yeah yeah and now that cm pet punk is back in AEW, back wrestling i'm like glued to that every nice. wednesday and friday <laughs> nice nice <laughs> yeah yeah um but trying to shut it off it's something i've actually been trying to be more intentional about this year picking up some things like I don't know. I kind of thought meditating wouldn't work for me. That's very like weird thought or not weird, but like it helps everyone. It's I a thought. That it helps. Yeah. Me. So it does. Yeah. 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 It's like a weird ego thought, but anyway, it's been a really great way to kind of take everything off the table and just um, get in touch with doing nothing um, and, and focusing on self in a way that's not ego feeding. Mm -hmm. um, nice. So those sorts of, yeah. Nice. Um, what kind of what kind of like books are you into? Do you listen to like audiobooks at all? That's been I my should. thing lately. Like yeah. I love it. There's something I love tactilely and I'll like I know it drives the people around me crazy, but kind <laughs> of rub the pages and makes this noise. Yeah, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. I yeah. Love that. Uh, but I love nonfiction. I love oh, it. Cool. Um and I frequently like to read books that are archaeological in nature. I love nice. um, that sort of angle, anthropological. Um, I'm reading a bunch about, you know, history or consciousness, mm -hmm. uh, kind of the nature of that or the human brain's evolution. Um, I try to read some like astrophysics books kind of over my head. Um, yeah, yeah. But I really enjoy kind of the questions of um, existence, human nature, culture type books broadly. Thing. Yeah, yeah, I can see that in your work actually. Like you're you're kind of using these like neo icons of like the 21st century mm. and and sort of mashing them up. Um I'm going to screen share here. This is a good uh segue into like talking about your work. I know that sometimes um that can be that can be weird for some people, but I think that that you'll do really well. Um so here I am. Um 
Oh, on your Instagram. Instagram. Yeah, on your Instagram yeah. page. Um, yeah. You know. Uh, yes. So, first of all, I think this one here is my favorite. It really. Um, oh, thank you. Um, for people who are just listening, um, what's the title of this work? Absentia. Absentia. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it's a. Uh, it's an airplane. It's like half airplane, half crumpled letter and then framed with kind of a digital envelope looking mm -hmm. thing i don't know why but this one really like hit me in my heart for some reason yeah. um, this one is probably one of the more personal pieces i've made so yeah yeah mm -hmm. nice and it's so i mean like for someone who who paints and i i tend to paint fairly medium to large like four by six inches is just like the detail in this how long do these take you um it depends this one was relatively quick four by six is pretty small um i would say the pieces can take a couple days which this one from start to finish and of course that includes the like laying it out and all that Mm -hmm. um, but the bigger ones, which I'm sure for you might be smaller ones, uh, mm. 16 by 20 is the biggest I've worked in quite some time. Uh -huh. um, and those can take a couple weeks and sometimes up to a month, you know, some of the ones that are more complicated, like I have a piece that was um, two mirrored images and getting that perfect took a lot of time and effort. Yeah. Um, but so I, a couple of days to a couple of weeks, but this one um, definitely is one of the more personal ones. So it means a lot to hear you say that it hits you that way. It was um, a show that was called Wish You Were Here. Mm. And so, um, you know, this one is about kind of a lot of different things. I don't know if you want me to go, go. Into. Yes, please. <laughs> okay. I want to hear it. Um, I, I really hate to fly. I'm a terrible flyer. It uh -huh. just fills me with anxiety. But um, this piece in particular, I made kind of addressing that topic um, and the wish you were here aspect being I have very good friends who at the time were in LA um, and had moved out there and we'd send letters back and forth. And this is a letter from my friend, Michelle. Mm. And we had planned to go and visit them and see an exhibition of mine that um, was opening. And it was the first time I had meaningfully exhibited in LA in any way. Mm -hmm. but um, coronavirus had stopped everything. Yes. And so this was kind of musing on missed opportunities, sort of missed friends, sort of that togetherness, the um, anxiety late in past year, but also my anxiety of, of flying and um, just how we communicate in general, you know, yeah. prior to coronavirus but even through it so yeah yeah i think that that the i mean the the crumpled up letter i don't know it's it it's so um i don't want to use the grandoise term of archaic but it's like you know like it's it's tactile like you were saying with books mm -hmm. right like it's it's not usually how we communicate these days and then I... the plane's almost like flying into it mm -hmm. and i think when I saw it, like, I think, like, it honestly, like, n no BS here. Like, it, like, unlocked some of the, um, like, stored emotions from the pandemic. You know, like, mm -hmm. I, I personally, for me, I was, like, in the beginning, I was, like, this is kind of cool. I like staying inside and stuff. Yeah. And then, like, um, I wouldn't say I, like, repressed anything, but I just didn't, like, address, like, how kind wow. of weird and and crappy things we're getting um right so yeah i just i i just wanted to shout out that piece i i really love Thank it you. it means a lot you know you're reading it in a way that um reflects what i put into it so i really appreciate hearing that yeah awesome so um how would you like if you had to i know this is annoying but if you had to describe like the type of work you make, um, mm -hmm. what would it be? It's such a hard one. I feel like a lot of stuff kind of gets lumped into this like 
pop surrealism category. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think of it as kind of surrealist, realist, um, because for me, I love rendering as well as I possibly can. Yeah. But I sort of hate things like perspective or when things need to like exist in a very finite plane. So I always felt very connected to looking at work like Frida Kahlo. I feel like that's sort of everyone's favorite artist, but um, Mm -hmm. you know, I loved how all these things could be very narrative and existing in a space um, that wasn't beholden to like, it has to be in a room or it has to be following a rule of how these images are scaled or how they exist to one another. Um, but also is very faithful to to true rendering. And so there are things like vaporwave that I mm-hmm. feel like creep into my work. Um, but I love realism. I'm a big fan of surrealism. I feel like this often gets pushed into kind of like the pop art um, category of making works. But um, yeah. But I guess that's where I'd place it. But I find, you know, people kind of define that for you. <laughs> you don't often totally. yourself have to totally. think a lot about that. They put you, they, whoever they are. But, yeah. you know, <laughs> you kind of get put in where people think you go by proxy. Right, right, right. Yeah, it seems like to me a lot of it, it there's like some collage to it. Yeah. And I love collage. Yeah, yeah. But it's, yeah, I don't know. It's so well done. Um, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely, you know, beginners collages. So there is that there as well. Yeah. And, and yeah, you're just, just your use of like the, the pixelated, mm-hmm. you know, pixelations and then the pixelated pixelations. Awesome. Uh, yeah. and, and just like, yeah, again, like kind of mashing up like tech iconography with like more, natural things i just uh i just can't get enough of it i really love it thank you i um feel very passionate i mean i don't know i love conspiracy theories they're sort of less fun mm-hmm. now that they have real world yeah <laughs> problem but um <laughs> you know and, th- and thinking about you know our culture and i think fundamentally humans are no different now than in any point in history but how we interface and the language and symbols that we use to express it or, you know, how we experience anything, if it's like a tragic event or a positive event or frequently um, finding it on a screen, you know, and um, a lot of our experience is sort of that secondhand symbolic filtered uh, digital experience. And so for me, I find all of that so inspirational, so fruitful um, Mm -hmm. that I just really enjoy, you know, I find, maybe the collage element of how I create these works, I hope reflects um, kind of the piecemeal way that we get information and connect with each other and um, experience the world really. Yeah. Would you say, it's, all... sorry, would you say it's a, like a critique of, of the kind of culture we're living in or just more of like, maybe more of like a mirror for I like to think of it more as a mirror. Mm -hmm. I mean, it can be a critique as well. It sort of depends what um, specifically maybe I'm talking about in each piece, but I'm sort of one of those, my mindset is that few things are entirely right or wrong. I mean, some things are obviously wrong. Right, um, right. But, you know, obviously you don't want murder. Right. Racism is wrong. But um, yes. I don't know that, you know, something like the internet or, you know, talking about like free speech on the internet Mm -hmm. and like how we handle it. I think that's something that's so, for example, so entirely subjective. I agree. You can't often um, limit or exploit something without the extreme of it being good or bad. And so um, I like to, think of it more as a mirror of that, although there is critique in there as well. Yeah. Yeah. um, I really like this piece too. It's actually hanging behind you. Um, Yeah. What's this one called? Because I don't see a a title here, but it, um, I mean, the first thing I think of is, um, you were talking about conspiracy theories, right? 
Mm-hmm. Um, what's your favorite conspiracy theory? <laughs> Ooh, my favorite conspiracy theory. <laughs> that one's hard. Um, my favorite conspiracy theory. I kind of like like the the classic Beyonce's in the Illuminati. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. One, uh-huh. one of my favorites. <laughs> um, but I don't know if there's one. I'm sure that it's like when I'm on the spot, it's so hard to say. Mm-hmm. But um, some of my, I would say like my least favorite and personally experienced, like when um, Pizzagate was really on fire. Yeah. Um, like I had this random dude from South Carolina emailing me and telling me that there's like secret pedophile symbols in my art. Mm. But he was saying, you know, when I ignored the first email, the second one was really mean and basically mm. telling me that I was like a pedophile shill. So oh. that would be my favorite because that one personally, I was like, God, you're like crazy. Leave me alone. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you just like the phenomenon of, of it all? Yeah, kind of, yeah. And I think of like how in some ways, how arbitrary. Oh, birds are drones. That's one yeah. of my favorites. Um, yes, yes. You know, this particular thing like I've been saying this my friends will probably be tired of me saying this but you think of a lot of times um, conspiracies deal with something that's more or less tangible in our lives right something like vaccine hesitancy is a big one right now Mm -hmm. but then I think of like all the unknowable things like I've read a book recently that deals with atoms and it's talking, you know, it's quite poetic because it's like we're made up of atoms, as is everything. Right. And the atoms in our body have been stars or flowers or even people who have already died. And there's so many atoms inside your body that, you know, we all share mm-hmm. some of these recycled atoms. And that's insane. Like you and I will never be able to look at an atom. We probably won't even know anyone. You have to be kind of like, pretty elite scientists yeah so i think like that's something why nobody's like that sounds like bs that can't be right (laughs) tiny little tree atoms make me up but though you know like you know people who've had a vaccine you could even yeah probably you have access to seeing something like that under a microscope but you'd have to really be somebody to see an atom yeah you know so it always kind of boggles my mind kind of how (laughs) anyone chooses and we all do it to some degree of like Sure. Uh, I accept this, but I reject this, you know? Right. Um, so for me, that's such a fascinating, like how we pick and choose. And for the most part, you know, I, I feel like people sometimes attach themselves to ideas or conspiracies that are very um, relevant and provable. And, exp- mm-hmm. you know, everyone knows someone who's been vaccinated. Right, right, right. Right. You know, so um, well, it's I- just interesting. I, I had, yeah, it's just interesting, like what people, you know, people's sort of idea of the truth is, right? Like, yeah, like truth is so, it's so hard to, to pin down even because with the, the whole process of science is proving yourself wrong and going mm-hmm. back to the drawing board and being like, well, maybe this map is a little bit more correct, you know? Right. And, I don't I don't actually believe so much in in free will like when I see when I see people, you know, believing in flat earth for existence or yeah. for <laughs> for example, um uh as their existence, I guess. Like I just think that we're we're sort of subject to, you know, things that we can't control like where sure. we were born, when we were born, the information yeah. that we have access to even even in uh, the world where, you know, there's tons and tons of information out there. Like we do get siloed based on what Google thinks we're going to want based mm-hmm. on some sort of avatar floating out there and in, in the digital space. 100%. So to me, there's so many factors that goes into, into someone believing one thing or not. Yeah. And I just think experience is so subjective. Yeah. You know, it's like how you and I are both experiencing the same interview and we'll remember it are two different things. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, that's something that fascinates me when like there is no, you can see the argument of like there is no objective truth, although there is, you mm-hmm. know, it's like mm-hmm. 
like one day you will die. That's an objective truth. Right. But like how you subjectively experience like all the life until you get there. That that to me, I guess, is like the fascinating part of all of it. You know, being on it's such a um, on the internet at all, or being human at all. It's like the subjective experience that um, we all share that makes up some kind of like objective world truth. Um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's kind of like this. I mean, you know, some things we just agree on. Yeah, for utility's sake, right? Like, mm-hmm. like th- for me, like the reason that free will is still around is because in a court of law, like if you do something fucked up, like kill someone or something, like we have to blame someone or we have to punish someone. Um, and you know, there's that whole like decision factor in yeah. based in that. And I, I don't think I'm like, I actually have sort of like evolved my views on this whole thing, um, via this show actually. And, uh, like, I don't think it's so simple as like free will and then determinism, but there's some sort of like confluence and paradox in there somewhere. And, um, yeah. Yeah. So you, thank you for, uh, for sharing your work. Oh yeah. I, I wanted to ask you one more thing. And this is, this is very, uh, sort of tangential, but like speaking of conspiracy theories, did you watch the, uh, there's like this documentary, I forget what it's called, but it's about like QAnon. It was on HBO. Uh, no, because I we like hate canceled HBO after Game of Thrones was ah, so crappy. Totally, <laughs> totally but understand. But I would have loved to see it with like the um, 8chan, 4chan guy yeah, essentially yeah. kind of being like. They sort of got him. I mean, like, yeah, yeah. And yeah, it's just so funny because like, like, the dude it was like a guy and his son and the dad Mm -hmm. was like former like military cia and you know you can't like you you, i don't know it's anyway i don't want to get too much into the weeds in that but highly recommend i would i still would love to watch QAnon's like (laughs) it's another one you know where it's like there's a lot of actionable things you can do like my mom has always worked social services Uh to help children Right. But people instead are choosing to do this like crazy performative, unhelpful thing. Yeah. You know, I, yeah, we don't need to go down that road, but that's just, <laughs> uh, yeah, I would like to watch the documentary. I've heard about it, but I got to, I got, I need to find someone's password <laughs> to get on their HBO account. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. So if you had to, if you had to guess, like, where do you think that like ideas come from or, or like where, like the fact that we're even conscious, like w- what is that all about? Like, are you more on the oh. side of like the brain is, is a, uh, is like a receiver for like things like this? Or do you think the brain itself like creates ideas and in, in consciousness? That's so, um, like for me hard to answer you know to a certain degree you could probably argue that like there's levels to consciousness Mm -hmm. and like how we define it you know like trees can communicate and yeah you would never call them conscious but you know um so i I, for me it's such a, a mystery and there's you know, whether consciousness is a soul or like, I do think your brain makes thoughts, you know, almost in like, in the way the car makes exhaust. Right. Yeah. yeah. Obviously there's a distinction between, you know, if I like put my dog in front of the mirror, he's not like, man, I'm like, I'm really alive. Like this is (laughs) me and like, (laughs) you know, so like there is that, that distinction, I think for humans, but, um, the nature of it I don't know whether it is understandable or not you know Mm -hmm. I have not yet started but I have a book on kind of like the idea of what is consciousness and is it widespread um and you know I think gosh that's such a hard one and I think it's like sometimes you have an experience where like you know for myself 
one that jumps out is like before my um, grandfather passed away, he called me the day before and was like, I'm not, I'm not going to be here tomorrow after like not talking, not speaking for a long time. Mm-hmm. And then the day he was the next day he passed. And so I was like, gosh, is that some weird next level, like through the veil consciousness of, you know, and, and so in some ways, I think it's more profound that we don't necessarily understand. Sometimes I think it's like the mystery of what something is, you know, would mm-hmm. it be worth thinking about if we just knew it was like your neurons firing, like on the left side of your brain or right. something, you know? Yeah. Um, it's I kind of like, what would that do for us? You know, like what? Right. It, <laughs> is the is that a good mystery to solve? I don't know. I, right. I mean, I like thinking about it. I like thinking maybe it's solvable, but um, is it ultimately better? It's mm-hmm. certainly more romantic to think of it as a soul or as this very unique thing. Sure. Um, it wouldn't be so cool to find out that it was just some like biological mistake. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, just some sort of static generated by like yeah, a brain. Yeah, and it's like... Yeah, it arises because X, Y, and Z. Um, right, right. Yeah, I, I don't know, but I don't know that I necessarily want to to know. Right. I think, like the thing on it is the poetry. Yeah, yeah. totally, totally. It's yeah. more fun to to just like, mm-hmm. you know, have some guy on a podcast ask you about it, and then yeah, you just like kind of be like, <laughs> it's a mystery, and no, I yeah. I totally get it because like, you know, if we if we figure that out and can be for certain what that is then like what's the you know after that what's kind of the point i guess yeah then what? <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> like is there i mean i think like the is there a point thing is so fascinating as well mm-hmm. um but but yeah i don't know it would take away <laughs> a lot of the kind of fun of it to know yeah yeah, yeah. well yeah i want to pivot back to um kind of like art and uh, the art world this is a question yeah. i've been asking people um you know, without, without like, um, you know, unnecessary shade thrown on anyone, what is a, (laughs) what is a brutal fact about the art world that you've come to find? Um, a brutal fact truly is probably the rejection. Mm -hmm. Um, and within that, I would say, um, and it's a, it's a great life lesson, at least for me is like, absolutely no one owes you their interests, their care, their mm-hmm. attention. You know, you create something and it's so intimate, you know, you pour all of your sort of thoughts and ability into it. Um, and no one owes it to you to, to think that's interesting or cool. That's right. Um, and so, you know, the, the, unless you we were very fortunate, kind of the cruel fact is like, there's a lot of legwork, um, that really only you are uh, empowered to do. You're your best spokesperson to make people interested in care, you know? And if you're fortunate, you have, you maybe you're represented and a gallery can do some of that for you, or maybe you exit like a blue chip school into a blue chip gallery. But, yeah. um, you know, as with anything in life, most people don't have that experience and you really have to harden yourself to rejection and make peace with thinking of yourself in some ways as a salesperson, despite Mm -hmm. creating this thing that is again, like just you pouring out your soul. It's very um, romantic and kind of like a piece of your heart on the paper or what have you, but uh, being able to market it otherwise, yeah. Where does it exist? Yeah. Other than in your eyes. Yeah. Totally. Completely agree on all those points there. Yeah. Uh, what it what's your biggest fear um as it relates to to being an artist? Oh. I mean my biggest fear is probably failure. Um and I think it's multifaceted the way that can look. You know, I can often be quite hard on myself. And so the failure might be like, oh, I was just on artsy AF and I could have said this and I could have oh. explained myself better. You know, like there's always that self-critique. Mm-hmm. But then there's also that day where it's like, oh gosh, I don't I don't have any plans of where my next show is going to be. And I've 
tried X, Y, and Z and I'm pushing and I'm pushing, but I'm hitting a wall and you know, the thing I'm making, even with my best efforts, um, that kismet of other people loving it or, um, you know, that it exists on a wall somewhere or that people are interested and find what I do resonant ceases to exist. So I think it's a multifaceted way of, of failure, but, um, in some ways it's like the motivational factor of like you right. go out there and you do your best and I did my best in that very moment. And then there's the like, Oh, what if, you know, yeah. everything I do is for nothing and nothing ever happens with this thing. That's so important to me and about me. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, but that. yeah, you use it, <laughs> yeah, you use yeah. it as fuel, right. Rather than try to, I think that's maybe the, the most, uh, best mind <laughs> like building way to do it, but. For sure. How do, how do you deal with self-critique? Um, it's hard. Mm -hmm. I'm, I think any creator, and maybe I'm sure you can relate, nobody can, is harder on me about my work than me. Um, totally. I certainly can see all the flaws. I can certainly sit there and be like, I can be finished now, but I could I could just keep working and working and tweaking and um I mean part of it is knowing when to be like hell you're being crazy like just step back yeah. um to yourself you know and kind of saying not all things are bad not all things are good you know there's that middle space where like I do think it motivates me I do think it allows me to always finish but it is it's hard to struggle with yourself and not find yourself turning positive, joyful things into negative things because you're overthinking them. Mm -hmm. um, there's no great answer. I mean, I think that's why I've been this year trying to be more reflective and meditative and, yeah. um, but it's not easy. I think when, when you're an artist, you're constantly um, trying to push yourself to be the best you can be in that moment. And it's hard not to always, think you could do better, I guess. I right. Guess. Yeah. 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 I totally, totally vibe with that. Like <laughs> something that I've, I've realized is that with paint painting, I think is a little more forgiving than, than the mediums mm -hmm. that, that you're working with. Like I, I would say definitely. Um, yeah. I, and I use acrylic paint mostly, but something I've noticed is that like, <laughs> it just seems like every every paint uh every stroke that i make i'm like it's not quite right and i like mm -hmm. i have like i have three brushes in my hands almost at all times like one with like loaded paint one that's like a little damp and then like a dry brush and so like right. i make a stroke and i'm like okay that wasn't perfect let's correct it mm -hmm. and it's all this like it's sort of like an allegory for life too like you you learn as you go and you can sort of like it's sort of forgiving enough for you to correct yourself right and i'm sure that like leading up to the work that you're making now like you've had you've had your correction in the in the prep process and in the uh you know previous works that you've done um so yeah i think that that's that's maybe how i deal with it and for me, for me, if, if like my energy is uh, at the end of the day, if my energy is spent, if I feel tired at the end of the day from what I've done, then it was, a, then I can say, okay, that was a good day. I did my best, give myself a little pat on the back there yeah. and, and <laughs> just like get back, you know, get back on it the next day. Right. Uh, yeah. Right. And just sitting with, it's never perfect. It'll always ideally be better. The next piece you make, the next year you're creating. Yeah. Some things you just have to like let, let it go <laughs> as yeah. hard as it can be. But do you ever get, do you ever get caught in the trap of comparison? Sure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, I think we all do like there are times where um you're scrolling through social media and there are so many artists that i respect and admire and it can be equally like so um 
like enlightening and inspiring and then soul crushing. And you think, you know, not so much, you know, I'll look at someone's work and think, you know, if it's similar enough to mine, like, oh, I, you know, they're so good. I wish I could be that good. But sometimes it's like, wow, they're really established in their career or they've done X, Y, and Z. And that's a goal of mine. Mm -hmm. And so it's not necessarily their work, but where you're, um, you're hoping that your achievement trajectory will head. Yes. Um, you know, and so it's easy to feel like I'll never get there. I'll never, you know, but, um, there's also that sense of like, I know the experience of most to all artists is the same, you know, they're also just trying to figure out what else they can put on their taxes. And mm. they're also editing their statements every time they have to send it out. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, that it comes with such a amount of work, anyone's success, you know, it's rarely that someone just gets lucky. Mm -hmm. Um, and so trying not to be totally soul crushed and, and letting it be this motivating factor of like, what lesson um, can I take from them? Sometimes, you know, you see that they're fabulous on social media and they have a thoughtful comment for every comment that comes to them and mm -hmm. thinking like, that's my great takeaway. You know, that's my learning lesson if I don't know this person personally or, you know, with my friends that do thinking like, oh my gosh, this person really knows painting theory inside and out, or they do a great job of like talking about their work in three sentences or something, mm -hmm. you know, being, um, paying homage to, to, to how well they do something, you know, trying to think of your own practice in that way mm -hmm. to eliminate the feelings of like, Oh, I'm, so, I'm not doing well enough. And like, Oh, look how, look at everything they have. Yeah. Um, because they can't, it's so inspiring, but it's so, it's hard not to be thinking of yourself in that same context. Sure, sure. It, it kind of gets back to the like using and, and and connecting with people to have them sort of be your mentors. It's like the community mm -hmm. as mentor sure. mind state there. And as long as you can take that and, and feel and like motivated by it, and and use it as fuel and put it in put it in your gas tank and transmute mm -hmm. it into like getting yourself you know on the trajectory to, that you want mm -hmm. i think then then it's all for the better but yeah i think like you were saying you can definitely you can fall into the trap of of feeling like oh my gosh like why am i not doing this i'm not mm -hmm. as good and and um yeah, well, you stated it beautifully. So, oh, thanks. Yeah, but, yeah uh, easy, easy trap to be in. Yeah, definitely. So, without any false modesty, is there a an artist that you would like to be compared to, in terms of your work? Ooh, that's a really good question. I have never thought about it before. Um. You know, someone whose work I often like zoom in on, who I am certainly not a peer with in terms of like <laughs> how successful they are, um, but someone who I look at their work and I don't know that it influences me, but I see, at least in the color pencil mixed media aspect, um, the artist Eric Jones. I don't know if you know offhand his work. It's a lot of portraiture. Yes, um, yes. He has, he has, it's like Eric with a K, right? Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. And, and um, yes, I love his stuff. It's, it's I wacky. Well, so. I, like his figures are so yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah. I love his work. And I just, again, I'm seeing like his color pencil work zooming in, 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 you know, his deals with more shapes or now he's sort of doing this at, like sort of uncanny valley. It looks like he maybe model rendered them somewhat in a program. Um, yeah. But um, yeah. So not to draw any equivalency between our work. However, if I were to want to be aspirationally put into a conversation, I, I do really respect his work and, and um, sort of think of it process wise as somewhat the same. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Nice. Um, so yeah, at, usually at the end of these, I have, I have my guests 
dole out some advice to younger artists or to yeah. even just a younger version of yourself? Like what, what kind of advice would you give? Um, I would have to say, you know, just being relentless in creating the work and putting the work out there. I mean, I truly, you, you just have to do that hustle. You don't serve yourself to not create the work mm -hmm. and you don't serve yourself to like be off social media or to sometimes you'll see um, artists being kind of coy, you know, where it's like very artsy stuff and maybe there's no pictures of you or you make the work and there's not um, context or description or interaction with the people who um, are appreciating it. Mm -hmm. that to say everyone's goals are different success to one person looks different to another but you know for myself it's like thinking about the work and not creating it takes you nowhere creating the work and not contextualizing and sharing it gets you nowhere so you have to um build build it so yeah. that there's just no there's no alternative to doing the work that's just the bottom line yeah that's what's up yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, Sarah, thank you so much. It was so nice meeting you. you. And um, yeah. yeah, just real quick, tell people where they can find you, what, what you have coming up. Um, and yeah, um, any upcoming, upcoming shows or uh, dream projects you have on the horizon? Um, well, you can find me on Instagram and TikTok. At, nice. at Sarah with an H, Jane Jameson, Jameson with an I. Um, my website is sarah jamesoncom I have a mural I completed literally yesterday. Oh my gosh. On the Metropolitan. I yeah. totally <laughs> forgot to talk about that with you. <laughs> Dang, Dang it. All the paint on my nail beds. No, it's all good. Um, um, <laughs> wait, let's go into it. Okay. You know, okay. was that your first mural? or not or... my first okay but it was um one of i've done very few murals mm -hmm. um and the second one i've done with um dc walls they've rebranded from being powwow okay um, nice the first one i did was an enormous wall of just memes i mean it was like 120 feet i had never in my wow. life painted a mural <laughs> so that one i went with something i knew was simpler and i could complete since it was my very first yes and since then, I've done a handful of smaller projects um, that I would not call, like, my own work. Mm -hmm. um, and so for this one, I thought, you know, I said to Kelly Tolles, the director, who's an amazing artist himself, you know, give me a small wall. I want to try to reproduce a drawing. So that was the very first time that I tried to um, make something fully rendered that reflects, like, a actual piece that I've made. Yeah. So... In that way, yes, it's the first. Wait, so, were you, you did you use a projector? Yes. Yeah. For that. That's I that's mean, the way, honestly. I mean, like at least yeah, you get some like outlines. I, um, a lot of people right. use like scribble grids and stuff, and yes, they're much better at spray paint than I am. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I've never. Yeah, the other muralists who do this all the time, like, oh, you, what kind of spray paint are you gonna do for that for that gradient? I was like, I've never used spray paint. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just gonna paint it. <laughs> yeah. Um so I'm definitely a new novice level on that in that way. But um but yeah, it it was a really great challenge and it was fun to like lean into being kind of painterly with it. And mm -hmm. the wall has a lot of texture. So um actually it was kind of helpful for that model that face. broken. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So but definitely weird to like you have to step back to appreciate the where you're at and see what you need to kind of adjust. Yeah. yeah. Well, sorry, sorry for taking this on that tangent <laughs> no, here no. at the very end. That's uh, that's no, so like me. I'm um, proud of myself. Yeah. Well, congratulations on that. And thank you. So, so what else do you have uh, on the horizon in terms of I shows, have, deadlines? Um, a current piece and an upcoming exhibition, um, group exhibition at Aver Gallery. Anthony Hurd's another phenomenal artist. That's yep. in Albuquerque. Mm -hmm. um i also will be creating a piece i might be in front of it but kind of started it over there nice um with bristol gallery up in new york 
and I, in the late spring, I'll be working again. I think it'll be a two or three person show with Anthony. Um, and then something else I don't legally know if I can say yet, but it'll be a fun sure. uh, pop-up thing happening here in DC nice. <laughs> within the next month. Yeah. Awesome. Well, yeah, again, thank you, Sarah. And oh, really appreciate you, your Andy. time. Really thoughtful question. So it was fun to, to discuss. Yeah. I came prepared. <laughs> um, it was awesome. Well, yeah, you're great. And um, I hope we we run into each other IRL sometime. Yeah. Yes, I know. I'd love for our paths to actually cross. Yeah. Really. We'll keep making great work. And um, we'll talk to you. We'll talk to you again. I'll have you back on. Let's do it. Let's do it. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for listening. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Recording stopped. Thank you again for listening to another episode of RTAF Podcast. If you are interested in supporting the Patreon, that address is patreon.com slash RTAF Podcast. And I want to thank all my patrons. You guys keep this engine running. I couldn't do it without you. Go over there and check out the tiers I have available. It includes video, uh, guest suggestions, uh, patron-only posts, and some merchandise. Thank you again for listening. Please rate, review, subscribe. Do all those little things that help get RTAF into the consciousness of more and more people. Shout out.